Hey, how are you all doing? So today I want to talk to you about Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon was one of those really, really controversial figures in history that everybody loves to speculate about. Now, apart from the smart people who like to speculate about things like how effective were his militaristic campaigns and what was his influence and how did he contribute to the French Revolution, what most people like to speculate about is was he really that short? I mean, the phrase a Napoleon complex is used to describe a really short guy who overcompensates for his stature by being really, really aggressive to everyone. But for such a well-known figure, you don't hear really many people talking about how Napoleon died. Now, surely the greatest French emperor of all time, he died in a spectacular fashion similar to his campaigns of war on the battlefield. Well, the short answer is no. Napoleon Bonaparte, after conquering essentially all of mainland Europe, but failing to capture Great Britain, where my Brits at, he lost the Battle of Waterloo and was exiled by the British to a British controlled island called St. Helena, which to this day only has a population of about 4,000 people. Now after losing the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon spent about six years on this island with a small retinue of people before dying of a routine stomach ulcer. So why am I talking about Napoleon's death? Now I think most of you have probably already figured out that I'm not going to say, and Napoleon died of a stomach ulcer, and that was it, okay bye bye now. No, the reason I'm talking about it is because Napoleon was such a controversial figure that there was a huge amount of people out there during the time he was alive that wanted to, well, kill him. So after all the dust had settled, some historians got their magnifying glass to the past out and started asking the very reasonable question of, was there anybody on the island who had a good enough reason to kill Napoleon Bonaparte? And more importantly, if so, how would they have done it? The answer to that second question, how would they have done it, was pretty much unanimously by arsenic poisoning. So here is a very brief history of arsenic. Arsenic was used extensively, and I mean seriously extensively, throughout the 18th century in order to assassinate people. It was used so much and so often as a way of killing those near to you that it earned the name inheritance powder. Because if you wanted a new pair of pantaloons, but mum and dad were being tight with the purse strings, because people literally had purse strings back then, and you didn't want to have to wait around for the next plague to come and off them for you, all you had to do was just stick a bit of arsenic in their food for a couple of weeks, and hey presto, you should have those spiffy threads in no time at all. So arsenic works by essentially choking you from inside. It inhibits an enzyme called PDH or pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is a key part of the Krebs cycle. Now if you're a keen biologist, those words might mean something to you, but for everyone else, it basically means that your body is unable to respire if you can't use this enzyme. Now if you are unable to respire, this can cause a rather serious case of death in all people who this happens to. Arsenic is also very similar in appearance to sugar and basically has no added flavor if you add it to other foods. So it's very, very, very difficult to detect if you are being poisoned by arsenic, especially seeing as it takes a couple weeks to months for the effects to actually kick in and kill you. So very scary stuff. So back in the day, you basically had no way of proving that someone was poisoning you via arsenic, unless you caught them bent over your soup pot, pouring it in and stirring it into your food. But in the 1950s, a group of very clever people came up with an atomic test for arsenic poisoning. Now I know what you might be saying. If only they'd been able to do this 150 years sooner, then maybe we could figure out what was going on with Napoleon's death. Well, dear viewer, you'll be very happy to hear that because of just how popular Napoleon was with his posse on the island, most of his entourage, when he died, wanted to take some kind of Napoleon-related memorabilia, I guess, to show their families. Now, because it was probably too gruesome to chop off a bit of his ear or squeeze out one of his eyeballs, most of the people on the island instead opted to take a strand of his hair back home. And unless you've not already figured out where this is going, what piece of somebody's body do you need in order to do the atomic test for arsenic poisoning? You guessed it right, a lock of hair. So when people finally performed this test about 150 years after Napoleon had died, the test came back, drum roll please, positive for arsenic poisoning. So now the question was raised, who had done this to poor old Napoleon? Now the first suspect was his mistress on the island, who he'd been seeing for a long time, but obviously because she was his mistress, would never commit to. Now she was actually found with a book on the island, which inside of it had 
techniques describing how you would give someone arsenic poisoning. So that seems like pretty damning evidence to me. The only problem is, is that she didn't have nearly enough access to Napoleon's food in order to give the constant doses of arsenic that you would need in order to actually kill him. So what about the British themselves? St Helena was of course a British colony, the British had sent him there, the British pretty much definitely hated Napoleon, and what reason was there for them not to kill him? Napoleon himself claims just days before his death, and I quote, if I die, I have been murdered before my time by the British oligarchy. It could have been the British, it might have been them. Save for the fact that the British spent a huge amount of time and money sending Napoleon over to this island and setting him up with this lovely retirement house and all the staff needed to cater for him. Also, shortly before Napoleon's death, his butler also died from symptoms very, very similar to arsenic poisoning. Now, because he wasn't quite as famous as Napoleon, obviously nobody took a strand of his hair, so we can't test exactly what it was, but it does raise the question of if he was actually killed, why would the only two people this secret assassin be going after be the ex-French emperor and his butler? So apart from the chance that some French-hating aliens came down from outer space to kill Napoleon, we don't have a killer with a motive or the means necessary to actually do it. But what if we didn't need a suspect at all? Now this is where the story gets really interesting. So when an astute British chemist heard about the story, he wanted to find out if anybody knew what the colour of Napoleon's wallpaper inside of his room was. He just really wanted to know if the wallpaper contained the colour green. He knew that in the 1800s, the most popular pigment used to make green wallpaper was something called Shields Green. He knew that 99% of the time, using Shields Green in your wallpaper was absolutely fine, especially back in England, where it is cold about 364 out of the 365 days of the year. But in warm and wet conditions, exactly like those found on St. Helena most of the year round, it has a very special and a very deadly characteristic. See, Shields Green contains something called copper arsenite. Now, copper arsenite is kind of like the harmless cousin of arsenic. However, if a fungus can get hold of this wallpaper and start growing on it, it can do a nifty little trick where it turns that harmless copper arsenite into regular dimethyl and trimethyl arsenite, which is basically the really, really bad kind of arsenic. So in 1980, during a radio broadcast for the BBC, David Jones asked if anyone would happen to know what the colour was. And amazingly, a lady responded knowing that exact answer. She hadn't just heard from someone else what the colour of the wallpaper was. She hadn't read in a book what the colour of the wallpaper was. She hadn't even seen a drawing of the colour of the wallpaper somewhere she actually had a clipping of the wallpaper which she was able to bring in for them. When she showed them the clipping, it contained a single star made up of gold, and the rest of it was the other imperial colour, you guessed it, green. So in order for this normally innocuous fungus to have really killed Napoleon, he would have had to spend a huge amount of time around the wallpaper. And from all accounts, he did. Napoleon basically spent his final days locked up inside of his room. He even built a trench around his house so that all of the guards patrolling wouldn't be able to look directly into his room. And then he cut out eye holes in his wall in order to look at anybody else walking around the island. His presence on the island almost vanished and most of the people there remark basically not seeing him at all during his final year alive. Ironically, Napoleon was so afraid of being murdered by the British that he ended up locking himself inside his room with the real killer duo, a wallpaper and its fungal partner in crime. So I guess the moral of this story is, if you're looking to go away on holiday this summer and it's going to be somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and you're looking for a roommate, do not make it a fungus. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and I'm sure we will see each other very soon. Bye-bye now.